Okay, uh, I think I want to read today uh, from Romans, uh, starting with chapter 3. And um, we're turning there. I'll tell you that um, in, my, uh, in my work during the week, in my farming work, there's a lot of tedious hours spent riding around and around and around, and I'm sure I don't have to tell everybody what, what goes on with farming. You know, for, in Alva, everybody's pretty much aware of how farming goes, but there's a lot of time, you have a lot of time on your hands. And uh, I, uh, I found out about it, Troy told me about it actually, at the library, they have a service where you can uh, uh, check out audiobooks. Remember that, Troy, you told me about the thing, and I went and uh, signed up for that. And you can uh, borrow for like 14 days or something. So I've been listening to lots of books, uh, and that helps pass the time, and plus you learn something. And uh, during this last several days, I've been listening to an audiobook about uh, <clears throat> some explorers uh, from England who uh, went to the Antarctic in 1914. And the man's name is Shackleton uh, that was leading the expedition. And they had, what they had planned to do was to take a, a bunch of dog sleds and they were going to land on the coast of Antarctica and then go across the whole continent and they were going to get picked up on the other side. And they wanted to be the first ones to do that. Well, what actually happened was they sailed down there into the, uh, now this is in uh, 1914 when they left. Actually, the very day that um, the, the event that started World War I took place, when uh, uh, the, uh, oh, the guy in Austria was a uh, Franz Joseph or somebody, uh, was, I forget what his name was. Uh, I'm not saying, I'm not getting that right. I should have looked this up. But, uh, anyway, right at the very beginning of World War I, and so basically, there was a lot of distraction. They were kind of forgotten about, but they got down into the ice, and uh, the ice closed in around their ship, and it was stuck fast in the ship. And so they spent six or seven months just sitting there, uh, immovable in the ice. And they kept thinking, well, as soon as it thaws out a little bit or an opening comes, we'll sail full speed ahead. And every time they saw a chance to go, they'd fire up the engines, and they just could not make it go. Well, then the next thing that happened was, after spending several months in their ship, stuck in the ice, the ice flow began to uh, converge on them, and it started to put pressure on the ship, and it eventually destroyed the ship, and it just it crushed it with the ice. So they had to evacuate the ship, and now they're on an ice flow with their tents and what have you, and they got the lifeboats and all the food they could and everything they had, and now they're on an ice flow, and the ship is, it, is crushed. And, and, then, and then when the ice relaxed a little bit, it just sank, and so then now they're stranded uh, on the ice. They've got little lifeboats, but, but that's all. And so the next thing that happened was um, the, uh, the ice flow they were camping on began to crack and break, and they'd jump across to the bigger piece, and it got smaller and smaller, and finally it just crumbled under their feet, and they had to throw everything quickly into the lifeboats. And now they're just in these three little dinky little lifeboats out in the middle of this, uh, this ocean off the coast of Antarctica. And uh, they were in constant danger of the ice crushing those little boats. It crushed their big ship. It could certainly crush, uh, crush those little lifeboats. And um, they, they, tried, they, were, they tried to row with their oars, and they finally were able to make a little headway through the ice, and they got out into some open water. But it was a constant struggle. There was salt water, freezing salt water blowing in their face. They were sitting in water. Everything they had was wet. Uh, their sleeping bags were wet. They were wet, freezing as well, and uh, frostbite and, uh, and everything bad you can imagine. Uh, and, and they spent... I guess it was probably three months in those open boats trying to get out of that situation and constantly in expectation or fear that they might be overturned or sunk or a whale could overturn or ice could crush them or uh, a wave could come and tip them over. It, just, it was just danger constantly. And uh, finally after about, th I guess it was probably, uh, if I'm remembering right, like 90 days in, in those boats, they finally found some land. And uh, they were able to get close enough to it, and still it's off the coast of Antarctica. It's not very good land, but it's just a little island. It's called Elephant Island. I remember the name of it. And finally, after a lot of struggling and fighting, they were finally able to get these boats to this land. And uh, the, the author of the book, by the way, the name of this book is Endurance, if you want to look for it. It's a good book by uh, Alfred Lansing is the author. And they finally, when they got made it to this little land, after spending months in these boats, in this open ocean, being constantly in fear of their lives, um, it says several of the men laid face down on the dirt and just clung to it on the gravel and just uh, prostrated themselves on, the, on the, the gravel, just clinging to it. Because, um, and this is what the author said, this caught my attention, the author said it represented to them 
what they suddenly realized was the most important thing in their lives, and that was security. Um, it, rep it represented uh, deliverance from the constant fear of, uh, of death, of being uh, thrown into the water, of drowning. That continual fear, uh, the island represented to them uh, security, which was relief from that constant state of fear. And when I heard that, I thought to myself, that is pretty good analogy for uh, a lot of the, uh, the way a lot of Christians experience uh, Christianity in a kind of constant state of fear. Uh, a lot, it, believe it or not, a lot of Christians do feel like that, constantly afraid that, you know, who knows, they might, uh, God might reject them, you know, uh, and maybe in the future he might reject them, maybe, you know, their salvation could be lost. And I want to tell you that um, I think, uh, for us as Christians, that that is the single most important thing for us as well, is to understand how secure we are uh, in the love of God. And what kind of secure, you know, and that, amazingly, that, that's the one thing that, having been around for a long time now and, and been on the receiving end <laughs> of a lot of preaching, it seems to be that's the one thing preachers don't want you to know about or don't want you to have or want to keep away from you. In fact, if you talk about security, some people call you a heretic uh, because uh, what I think most preachers have on their mind is using fear, fear of God, as a, as a kind of an inhibitor on uh, bad behavior. And that's the way, uh, in a social sense, that's the way the Middle Ages uh, operated. When the Roman Catholic Church was the dominant force in the Middle Ages, used uh, fear as a social inhibiting factor, just like the secular laws, you know, uh, try to inhibit uh, undesirable behavior by fear of punishment. But you cannot grow as a Christian, and you cannot be stable and, uh, and successful as a Christian if you're in a constant state of fear, in a constant state of turmoil. So I'd like to uh, su suggest to you and say to you, first of all, that you are secure as a Christian, and God will never reject you. Jesus will never reject you. He said, he said so himself. He said as much himself. Uh, he said, he that cometh to me, I will in no wise turn away. Um, he, he will never reject any Christian. Uh, Christians are secure. Now, I know that may rub some people the wrong way, but it shouldn't. It shouldn't rub you the wrong way. So I'd like to talk about a couple of things that, uh, uh, that demonstrate that or secure that. You know, I like to approach this subject from all kinds of different angles because I've come to believe that, that is the single most important thing we need to um, be convinced of as Christians. And uh, you are whether you know it or not. You know, you can go through your life, you'll find out eventually that you were secure. <laughs> But you can go through your life experiencing constant dread and turmoil and anxiety and, uh, you know, uh, in misery. And uh, I don't think that, so you cannot, uh, you, you can't function properly if you're in a constant state of turmoil and anxiety and, and fear. You know, John said in his first epistle, perfect love casts out fear. So it's obviously a desirable thing. Um, anyway, I'd like to uh, talk about... This is a, might seem like a, an odd way to approach this, but I'd like to talk about some of the passages in the New Testament that um, are universal, that include everyone. And if it's universal, includes everyone, it includes you too, and me as well. The first thing is, uh, this is in Romans chapter 3. Did I tell you that already? And I want to read verse 10. The first point I want to make is that this might seem like a negative at first, but it's actually a very positive thing. Uh, sin is universal. And here's one passage that demonstrates that. Romans chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says, as it is written, and here he's quoting Psalm uh, 14, verse 1, there is none righteous, no, not one. That's why he says, as it is written, he's quoting. And he has just got through making an argument to that uh, effect. Then he quotes from a whole bunch of Old Testament passages. For him, the scripture, it was Old Testament. Uh, demonstrating that very fact. But look at this, what it says. There is none righteous, no, not one. So when he says none righteous, no, not one, uh, that includes everybody. That is, a, he's drawn a big circle and, and lumped everybody into the same circle. Can you see that? In other words, that, what that means is there's nobody that meets the standards. There's nobody that is in and of themselves uh, approved of God. Now, while that might seem like a negative at first uh, glance, well, it's actually positive because that, what that says to you is you should understand that what's implied by that is 
if God understands that there's none righteous, nobody meets the standards, then he's not sitting up there expecting you to do it. Sure got quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> If he knows this, if he said, if he put this in the Bible, there's none righteous, no, not one, then he knows that that's the fact, and he's, that there's not an expectation for you to be perfect. Now, what we sometimes think is, well, you know, there's, there's some super saints out there, like Billy Graham, you know, or, you know, Joyce Meyer, or I don't know who, you know, who, everybody, uh, whoever you say, whoever's on television, you know, that's generally who it is, whoever's a celebrity. So I'm kind of super, but me, you know, I've, I've got my faults, I've got my flaws. Well, what this is telling us is there aren't any super saints. There's nobody that's good enough. There's nobody that measures up. Now, here's another verse. Skip over just a couple of uh, verses later and look at what it says here. Another one, he's, he says pretty much this. Now, I'm skipping a little bit here, but I'm going to come back and fill in the gaps of what I'm skipping after I make this point. Verse 19. Skip down about nine verses. Verse 19. Now, we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Now, when he says all the world, you understand that that means everybody. Right? That's a universal statement, isn't it? So he says that, uh, and by the way, he's talking about uh, the Old Testament law. He's making an argument to his uh, Jewish Christian uh, readers who might be tempted to trust in the law instead of trusting in Christ. And what he's saying is that the law speaks to all those that are under the law for this purpose. And here's what he says, that every mouth may be stopped. What does that mean? Uh, that all the boasting and the bragging might come to an end. All the saying, well, I'm better than you, you know, self-righteousness. Um, it's very tempting to be that way, to think... Uh, either to think there's some super saint out there and I'm not so good in comparison, or that we're really good and that there's other people worse than us. What this is saying is we're all in the same boat, that all, uh, every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. Now, we're going to talk about the good news about this in a minute, but what's implied in that is everybody's in the same boat and nobody measures up. So that means everybody's helpless, basically, to make themselves right with God. That means God's got to intervene and do it himself is what's, what we're going to find out explicitly. But before we get to that, skip a few verses, and I'm going to fill in these gaps here in a minute, because it's, and I, I really am reluctant to skip over these, because I'm skipping some really, really good stuff, but we're going to come back to it. Verse 23. This is one of the most famous verses in the world. Everybody just about, us, right after John 3.16, um, everybody knows Romans 3.23. For all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. Now, again, I'm, I'm, exercising discipline here not to keep on reading, but I just want to make the first point that uh, sin is universal. Now, if you've seen it from these three verses, there's lots more we could read, but here there's three right in one chapter. When he says all, that means everybody. And that means uh, people who are not Christians, and it means Christians too. Now, I've been in church before in discussion groups and Bible studies and heard, um, I almost say liars, that's a harsh word, blowhards, <laughs> maybe that's a better word. I've heard people say, well, I, I can say that since I became a Christian, I've never sinned. <laughs> and, I, and what I wanted to say, when I, I want, except for tonight when you lied. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then the, per, the very person that said that qualified it immediately. He said, well, well, I can say I've, I've never sinned willfully. That's also a lie. <laughs> That was one right there when he said that. <laughs> you know, the idea is that there's this expectation, you know, that, or this false impression that uh, when you become a Christian, God forgives you up to that point, and then your slate's wiped clean. Now see if you can do any better. You listen, he knows what we are, and, and there isn't anybody who hasn't, as a Christian, there isn't any Christian who hasn't made a mistake or done something wrong. Big, little indifferent, in between, doesn't make any difference. When he says all have sinned, he means everybody. That's universal, isn't it? Isn't all mean everybody? Yeah. Now, again, we're going to come back to these uh, verses that I'm skipping over here in a minute, but uh, just in the same way that sin and the failure to measure up is universal, and there's no exceptions, in the same way the availability of salvation now, notice how I said that. The availability of salvation is also universal. Uh, look at, right here in Romans. Turn a page over to chapter 5. This is a remark, you know, chapter 5 in Romans, this is one of the most remarkable chapters. And look at what it says in verse um, 
Oh, I think 18 is what I want. Romans chapter 5, verse 18. He says, uh, therefore, and I'm jumping in, of course, in the middle of his discussion, so I'll have to explain what he means, perhaps, unless you, you know, can see it evidently. Verse 18 says, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. And by the way, who he means there, if you go back and read uh, earlier in the chapter, he means Adam. His argument is that Adam, by his sin, uh, conveyed to us a nature or an aptitude to sin. And that's the one that he means there. So he means Adam in the beginning, the first man who sinned. The first man and also uh, the one who sinned. Therefore, as by the offense of one, that's Adam, listen, judgment came upon all men. That means everybody, doesn't it? All people. To condemnation because of Adam. And he says, in the same way, or even so, that means by the same uh, principle, even so, by the righteousness of one, and that's Jesus here, verse uh, 18, by the righteousness of one, the free gift, and that, by that he means the gift of righteousness and the gift of salvation, the free gift came upon all men and to justification of life. Now what we're going to see in a minute is that uh, the specific part about this, see, we're talking about what's universal, the deciding factor is, is who believes it uh, or not, who accepts it or receives it. But it's available to everybody, that's the point he's making here. By the righteousness of one, notice that it's not by the righteousness of you, but by the righteousness of Jesus. The free gift came upon everyone. You notice how that's universal, all men, unto justification of life. Now, the reason that's important, and the reason I'm harping on that a little bit is, you may run across in your life uh, people who uh, believe in an extreme form of something called predestination. Now, that's a, a big fancy multisyllabic word that's found in the Bible, but people take it out of the Bible and make it mean something other than, what, than its context in the Bible. And so there's this whole superstructure of doctrine built up, up around a word. <laughs> to the exclusion of, what it, of its context where it's actually found in, in the Bible. And according to this uh, theology of predestination, God uh, prejudges everybody and predecides who's who and what's what and who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. And, and it's like he looks down from heaven and says, uh, by my predestination, this one here, I'll save him, and this one here, I'm just going to throw him away. This one here is saved, and this one here is damned, and there's nothing we can do about it, and it's all predecided by God. Well. One thing is, number one, number one, that's not what the Bible teaches us. And if I had time to talk about that, I could show you that clearly. Number two, one is that's not what the Bible teaches. Number one, number two, that makes God something the Bible tells us He's not, which is a respecter of persons. Did you know the Bible says over and over again, God is no respecter of persons. Have you ever read that or heard that? That's, now that's pretty clear. You know what a respecter of persons means? That means He, he uh, treats people differently. What it means when it says God is no respecter of persons is He treats everybody the same. Now that fits in with, uh, perfectly with the idea of perfect justice, perfect fairness. God is no respecter of persons, so that means He doesn't choose one and reject another one. Number three, if that's how it is, what do we bother preaching for? <laughs> Seriously, I'm, I'm serious about that. If that's how it, if God's just going to choose, then we might as well just go on our merry way and just forget about it. Let Him do the choosing. It's his business, let him figure it out. <laughs> but no, it's not like that. And what we're going to see in a minute is belief or faith or accepting or saying yes to this justification that we just read about. Saying yes to Jesus is important. That's the freedom that he grants to everyone. But please notice here that it says that this, um, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men. Notice that all men means everybody not men to the exclusion of women. By here he means mankind. All people, everyone, to the justification of life. Now, just as sin is universal, likewise salvation is available, universally available. In other words, he included everyone in his plan of salvation, including you and me. Uh, here's another one that demonstrates that. And I just want to make these uh, perfectly straightforward and clear to you. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we sing about verse 17 sometimes. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away, everything's been made due. That's a good one. 
But if you go on reading, you'll eventually come to uh, verse 19. Chapter 5, verse 19. Look at this. The previous verse, verse 18, ended with uh, this statement. Jesus has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19 begins, to wit. Now that's fancy lawyer talk or old English. To wit means this is it, or specifically here it is. The ministry of reconciliation that he's given to us is this. God was in Christ, and, and in the context here he means at the cross. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Notice that he doesn't say just the Christians. Notice that he doesn't say a certain group. He says the world. Now when you see the world, that is a word that implies universality. Is it, is it not? The world. He doesn't, he doesn't mean the rocks and the magma at the center of the earth and the clouds. He doesn't mean that. He means the people. All the people. And the world means universally everyone in the world. Reconciling the world to himself. Now here's, here's the point where a lot of Christians uh, have a hard time. It's easy for us to accept that he's reconciled us. Because <laughs> we're here at church on Sunday morning. But this says he's reconciled everybody. Now they may not know it yet. And they may not have accepted it yet. But it belongs to them. As far as God's concerned, he's done it. And he's not mad anymore. Now they can stay at arm's length if they want to. You know. Again, I've never really understood why people uh, have that attitude. Um, but it's them separating themselves from God, not the other way around. God's not separating himself from sinners. He's already reconciled the world to himself. That's why, that's why you cannot uh, fall into the trap of thinking God's judging America or God's judging New York City or God's judging San Francisco or God's judging you or me or somebody else. He's already reconciled the world to himself through Jesus. That's why when tragedies happen, do not let anybody tell you that's the judgment of God. When a tsunami or an earthquake or, you know, or 9-11 or some other kind of tragedy, you always find these, uh, you know, know-it-alls. And I'd like to know how they got the direct line to heaven to find that out. How you can turn current events into the will of God. I'd just like to know how that works. <laughs> well, truth is it doesn't work. And it's just somebody's opinion. But we're so quick sometimes, people are so quick to speak for God. Well, this is the judgment of God. No, it's not the judgment of God. Here's how I know that that's not true. Because God, did you see it right here in this verse? God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That means all the people that they are telling you he's judging, he's already ready to reconcile himself to them. He's not mad, in other words. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. You know, if this weren't printed here in black and white, well, in this case, white with black outline. <laughs> If this weren't printed here in my Bible, I'd be tempted to not believe that. Now, here's the good thing about you as an individual. If, are you part of the world? Yes, you are. Then he's already reconciled himself to you, not imputing your trespasses to you. Well, sometimes people balk at that. How can that be? Well, because he's already imputed. You see, imputes a counting term. It means to lay to your charge. He's already imputed it or charged it to somebody else, and that's Jesus. That means that charge has already been paid. That debt has already been paid. Uh, that punishment has already been exacted. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Well, that's supposed to be our message, not God's judging somebody or this or that or the other thing. We should just forget about all that. I, <coughs> you know, I think sometimes I'm just sort of ashamed at what I hear coming out of uh, people who are speaking for the church. You know, no wonder people don't want to come to church, you know. If you got this impression of God's sending tsunamis and earthquakes, I want to stay away from place. No telling what would happen to me if I walk in the door, you know. Might be a tsunami carrying me away. Um, God <laughs> was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Here's one more that tells you that salvation is, uh, that he has everybody in mind. This is in 1 John chapter uh, 2. 1 John chapter 2 verse 2. And again, I'm just jumping in here. I, I'm not reading all the verses surrounding it, which I'd like to if, if we had time. There's, I'm skipping some really good things, but just to get to the point I want to make. 1 John chapter 2 verse 2. He, that's Jesus we're talking about here, He is the propitiation for our sins. Our here means our as Christians. Our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. 
Propitiation means a sacrifice that is satisfactory or is sufficient to uh, satisfy the demands of justice. He is the sacrifice for our sins. Of course, we're quick to accept that. We understand that. But not, he says, not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. One sacrifice was good enough for everybody. In other words, can you see that it's universal? Everybody see that? The sacrifice that Jesus made, his sin, the sins that he carried in his body on the tree were the sins of everybody in the world, yours included. Now, here's the deciding factor. You know, if, if that were the end of the story, if I could just say amen here and close the Bible, you might go away with the idea that everybody in the world is automatically saved. And so, and some people, you know, misunderstand when, you, when they hear you talk about security and they hear discussions about the, pointing out these things that are universal, misunderstand and think that's what somebody like me is saying, and I'm not really saying that because it's necessary for a person to, okay, let me put it to you this way. If I wrote you a check and I found out you had some kind of need and wrote your check, what you've really got in your hand is just a piece of paper, Right? Yeah, it's not really worth anything. It's just a piece of paper. But what you've got to do, if you want to have some spending power, if you want to get the benefit of it, you've got to take it down to the bank and you've got to endorse it on the back. Isn't that true? They still require that, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, Janet, you've, you should know. You've been there. Yeah, you, yeah you've got to sign it on the back. That means you've got to agree with it. You've got to put your uh, John Henry on it, so to speak, on the back. Lily, do you know what that means, John Henry? That's, that's a way of saying signature. <laughs> That's a, one of our colloquialisms. Um, I don't even know who John Henry is. Was he the guy that dug the big tunnel through the mountain? Oh, that's somebody else. On the railroad, wasn't he? There aren't, on the railroad? Yeah, is that right? Yeah. Something like that. I need to look into that. Find out who, why we say that your signature. Is. Anyway, you've got to endorse it. That's what I mean. See, that's what faith is. Faith is your... It's, it's, it's as though God has written a check to everybody in the world. It's called salvation. But, see, just like when you get a check, you, you've got to personally endorse it. See, if I had a stack of checks for everybody in the town of Alva, uh, you know, only the people who pick them up and endorse them are going to get the benefit of it, right? Yeah. That's why uh, we here are sitting in, in church, on because we've endorsed it. We've put our faith in Jesus. That's why we preach, you know. If God were picking and choosing who's saved and who's not saved, we don't need to preach. But that's why we preach to people and tell them supposedly what we're supposed to tell them is that they're reconciled, that God's already reconciled himself to them. And then what we, if we would have gone on reading in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it would have said, now that God's reconciled to you, why don't you be reconciled to him? You see, that's, that's our message, that God's not mad. He's put away your sin by the sacrifice of Jesus. Um, and notice it says, not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Now, what I started to say was faith is the deciding factor. Go back to Romans 3 just for a second where we started. I think this is really, really good. You remember the verse I read in verse 19. Let's read that one more time. Now I'm going to include the verses that I skipped over before, and I want to point something out to you. You see, I've, I've got, actually, I've got friends. I've got very good friends that I like who, uh, who want to kind of make it different than it is and say, well, you know, because of Jesus, everybody's automatically saved. Uh, but see, you notice here that these verses say that uh, it's necessary for us to believe it. That's how we endorse it. It's not hard, you know, and he didn't make it difficult. But here's the thing. God's not a bully. He's not, uh, uh, he's not forcing. He doesn't force anyone to accept. Um, it's free. It's a free gift. But just like any free gift, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to take it. I remember one time, and I've told you this story before, I think, so I'm going to tell you the abbreviated version. I, I went down to the county jail down here to talk to a, a person that had, uh, uh, in case you don't, well, uh, this couple, a man and his wife came here and they uh, sat in church, and then after it was over, said, we need money and we need groceries, so uh, I went to the store and got them some groceries, and uh, didn't know what else to do, got them some Tide laundry detergent and some groceries and all the things they mentioned, took it to their uh, house. It was a, uh, actually a mobile home. Uh, actually, it was a house owned by John Plummer, if you know who he is, the guy here in, used to live here in Alva, one of his rental properties. And then not long after that, I heard that this person, that, uh, he mentioned his name, did you know he's in the county jail? I said, no, I just saw him the other day. I took groceries to him. Well, uh, the reason they asked for groceries is they were going to all the churches asking for groceries, and they were using what little money they had to 
uh, buy the material to make a meth lab. And they made a meth lab in poor old John Plummer's uh, rental property and blew it up. <laughs> and there was a big explosion and a fire. And, you know, it's right down here. Yeah, you know, don't you? Right, right down the street down here. Yeah, right around the corner over here. And it caught on fire. And uh, I, actually, I drove over there. I saw the inside. It was, it was pretty bad in there. And the fire department came. And I'm sure that the guy and his wife probably were standing around like they were in the cartoons, all black in the face and their hair all standing up, you know. But they, uh, they figured out right away what had happened and took him down to the county jail. So I went down to the county jail to talk to this man. And what my message was uh, to him and what I wanted to go and tell him was, God's not mad at you and uh, everything, you can, you can be right with God, you know, and uh, you don't, don't, you know, uh, you, God's not upset with you and you can, you can go on with God. I don't know if he's even a Christian. At the, you know, we didn't get into that. He just came and asked for money. I was going to, actually what I did was I came in there and talked to him for a while and uh, talked to him about grace and the love of God. And I said, can I pray with you? And he said, yes, I, I need prayer. And just before I started to pray with him, I looked down and in that cell with him, in that cell was another man. And, and I didn't see him at first because he was hiding under the covers. And I guess he thought when the preacher is coming in, I don't want to see any preacher. So he hid under the covers. He did. I'm telling the truth. There's just two guys in this one cell and this one of them. And I didn't even know. I was, you know, probably 10, 15 minutes. I, he was hiding so well. And when I just was about to pray, I looked down and saw these little eyes peeping out from the covers. He's watching to see when I'm going to leave. And, and I, was, I was kind of embarrassed then because I've been spending all my time talking to this one guy and I just ignored, the, of course, in my defense, I didn't see him hiding there. But uh, I said, how about you? Uh, can I pray with you too? You know, he said no. <laughs> and, I, and I couldn't believe it. And he said, no. He said, then he pulled the covers back and now he starts to talk. He's, he said, no, he says, uh, I want to wait till I get back to my home church, and I want to be baptized. And I said, well, that's really commendable. Oh, and he said, I didn't ask him. I didn't care. He said, yeah, I stole a car, but I meant to take it back. And, but it caught on fire before I could take it back. <laughs> well, that's kind of an unlucky thing. And, uh, and I didn't care about that. I didn't ask him about that, but he told me that. And, he says, and I said, well, it sounds like you need Jesus in your life. He says, no. That's what he said to me. No, he said. Now, see, what I'm talking about is even though it, it's available to everyone, God doesn't force everyone to have it. It's a, it's, and I was trying to give it to him. I, there's no way I could twist his arm and make him take it. I could offer it to him. I could say, I'm going to pray with you. I'll lead you in a prayer. I'll tell you about Jesus. I'll tell you about grace. I'll tell you about salvation. And he says, no. He says, I want to wait. He said, I want to wait, and then he, you know, I don't really believe this is true, but he said, I want to wait till I get out and get back to my home church and be baptized. And I said, I'm not a lawyer and don't know about, you know, what your charges might mean, but it sounds like it might be a little while <laughs> till you're back home to your home church again. And he said, yeah, but I want to wait. And then it kind of riled me up a little bit, you know, and I, I said, you know what you sound like to me? He said, you, you sound like a person who's being... A drug behind a car on the end of a chain who says, let me go around the block one more time. <laughs> you know, I come and say, let me let you loose. And you say, no, I want to go around the block again. <laughs> you know, but I couldn't, I, I thought maybe that would jar him into understanding his situation. But he said, no, you see. Now, the point I'm making is that even though it's a free gift, even though it's freely available, even though God has already reconciled himself and Jesus has taken away the sins of the world, we saw that, the world. God has reconciled himself to the world, including that man in that cell there. I could not force him to, to accept it. I could not force him to come into that relationship. He had to come to, and I trust that by and by, he's finally come to that recognition. Here's what it says. We read verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. And I made the point from that that Guilt and sin is universal. But no, notice what it says next, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. In other words, a being right with God apart from what you do is manifested. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And just so you know what he means, he gets more specific in verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, and by of there he means from. 
the righteousness that comes from God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. He said there's a being right with God, and it comes through faith in Christ. And listen, unto all, and upon all them that believe. You see how universal that is, but the what makes it specific is whoever believes, whoever t accepts it by faith. It is the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus. It's for all and upon all them that believe. And then he says, for there's no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now we know verse 23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The end of verse 22 says about that, what that means is there's no difference. We're all in the same boat. That's what it means. We're all in the same category, all in the same boat. Verse 24 going on says, well, verse 23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24 says, Being justified, that means made right with God freely. Freely. Do you know what free means? What does it mean when you go to the store and you see a, a big cardboard thing and it says free? That's, it means I'm going to pick one up and take it with me whether I know what it is or not. Because <laughs> I might need that later. <laughs> might be stranded on, on the ice in Antarctica and need that thing. <laughs> no, yeah, free means no charge. Is that right? It means anyone can have it. Is that right? And by the way, when things are at the store and they say free, that doesn't mean they're going to jump out of the thing into your cart. You've got to reach out and take it, don't you? You see, same way with salvation. That's what, that's what faith is. Freely. I like that word freely. That means you don't pay for it. That means it's not based on uh, how good you are. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, I like that, uh, uh, as a matter of fact. Turn back quickly to uh, chapter 1. I'm almost done. Chapter 1, verse 16. Here in Romans. Stay in Romans, chapter 1. Verse 16. This is a pretty familiar verse, but notice what it says here. I, what, the point I'm working on now is that faith is what makes it specific. Verse 16. But never the, nevertheless, even though faith makes it specific, it's still free. It's still free, and there's no charge. Faith is just saying yes to it. Faith is just like signing the back of the check, saying, yeah, I agree with it. I'll take it. It's good enough for me. Verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, meaning I'm not backing off. I'm not uh, going to modify it. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, that is the gospel of Christ, is the power of God unto salvation, meaning it's the power of God resulting in salvation. Listen, to everyone that believes. It's God's power resulting in salvation. It's for everyone that believes. And that's all the requirement, or that's all that he asks, is that we accept it or believe it. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness, literally a better way to say it today, being right with God, revealed from faith to faith. Now one more. This is the best one of all. I think this is where, this one you can see it, uh, this principle more clearly than in anything else. And we quote it all the time, and you know it without even turning to it, but let's turn to it anyway, or Anton will put it on the screen. Uh, John chapter 3 and verse 16. This is probably the most familiar verse in the whole world, in the Bible anyway. John chapter 3, verse 16, and uh, we know what it says. For, for God so loved who? The world. Do you notice that that is a universal expression? World means everybody, right? That's universal. God universally, He doesn't hate the world. He's not mad at the world. He's not upset with the world. He loves the world. That means everybody in the world. For God so loved the world, and that love of God for... And by the way, you're included in that. Did we find John 3, 16? God so loved the world that He gave, His love motivated Him to give... His only begotten Son, which is Jesus, of course. Now, so far, everything's been universal, hasn't it? The world means everybody. God loved the world. He gave Jesus for everybody. Isn't that right? He didn't pick one and exclude another one. Verse uh, 16, halfway through, it says, That whosoever believeth in Him. And again, whosoever also means that it's available to everyone. That also uh, contradicts the idea of predestination which says that God chooses. This says that whoever believes, whoso that means anyone can. It's free to anyone. Whosoever believeth in Him. But notice that it makes it specific in that it's whoever believes in Him. 
He doesn't make it hard, he just made it specific. It, it's not hard to believe, it's, uh, it's just a matter of saying yes to it. Uh, grace is God reaching out toward us, and faith is our positive response. For God so loved the world that he gave, his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him... Now, see, I hope you can understand that and, and see yourself in that, that this means now you as a Christian, because what you've done is you've believed in him. It says, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Um, what it's saying here is because you believe on him, you have everlasting life. And then this little expression, should not perish, we take perish to mean uh, die. But if you look it up in Strong's Concordance, which I, I do, I look all these words up, it, it mean, it's a word that has to do, it carries the connotation of rejection with it. It implies being discarded or taken out with the garbage is what it means. So it says, whosoever believeth in him, I'm going to say it this way, shall not be rejected or never be refused or uh, shall not be discarded. So you can see by that, if he loved you enough to send Jesus, you know, by the way, if our salvation is so flimsy and so weak and so insubstantial that it can be uh, ruined by our mistakes, then it's not much of a salvation anyway. But in the book of Hebrews, it said that Jesus has obtained for us eternal redemption. Not intermittent redemption, but eternal redemption. It's not flimsy. It's not weak. It is so strong that it's immovable. It's like a mountain. It is immovable. It cannot be moved. And uh, here's a good promise. Whoever believes in him. Now, say to yourself, that's me. It means you, yeah should not perish. That's he's talking to you. Will never be rejected is what that means. And have everlasting life. Because, and see, there's no other qualification. He didn't say whoever believes in him and then after that lives a perfect life and never does anything wrong. He could have put that in there if he wanted. Because the truth is we all make, make mistakes. But see, the good news is that Jesus has already foreseen that and he's the propitiation for our sins. By the way, that verse we read in 1 John. Do you think about, that? Think about this for a minute? John said he is the propitiation for our sins, meaning us Christians. That implies that there is the expectation, or at least foreseeing the possibility that as Christians we might have a sin or two. Because he said he's the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. So I should have thought of that when that guy was telling me at that Bible study, well, since I've been a Christian, I've never committed a sin. <laughs> well, at least not, not willingly. <laughs> Oh, oh, somebody twisted your arm. That's how it worked. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's all I got. Let's all stand up.